you've read so much it's unrecognizable. The answer is mold, a myriad of minute mushrooms. Entering the world of this plant is a fantastic experience. appears to be a very unattractive, powdery mass. Actually, it lives by continually ramifying and changing itself. It multiplies with extraordinary speed, covering large surfaces in a few hours, and proliferating on the most unlikely substances. Mushrooms feed on organic substances and play an important role in the life of wooded areas where they exist. They rapidly convert fallen trees and leaves into nutritious substances that can be absorbed by the plant roots. Because of these and other characteristics, scientists before the 19th century placed mushrooms in the animal kingdom. Looking for mushrooms in woods outside the city, you'll know how difficult they are to find. In ten days' time, a mushroom can grow and die, having completed its life cycle. fact we've been using the wrong term up to now. What we call mushrooms are nothing more than the fruit of the fungi plants. They live underground in a tangle of whitish filaments called a mycelium. The initial reproduction stage is caused by the germination of the spore or seed of the fungus. The spores look like very fine powder. They are so numerous because very few of them succeed in finding a place congenial to their germination. The spores produce elongated cells called hyphae, which become the mycelia. When the network of hyphae cannot expand any farther, it looks for a new way out above ground and produces the fruit-bearing body. Its function is to mature until it disperses its seeds. Pier Antonio Micheli, at the beginning of the 18th century, was the first scientist to note the importance of the fungus spores. Before him, in fact, Fungi were not considered organisms capable of reproducing, but simple pathological degenerations of the humors of soil and plants. Several characteristics, such as poisonousness, Stench and edibleness were discovered to be specializations, that is, important advantages which the individual species created to best exploit environmental conditions. 
Some mushrooms, for example, possess within them a range of different poisons, each of which acts differently on individual predators. This is the only way these plants can defend themselves from animals that would massacre them. The much sought after Amanita caesarea, better known as the royal agaric, is often confused with its dangerous toadstool relative, the Amanita muscaria. If you're not careful, its poison can be very dangerous. It attacks the nervous system, causing tachycardia, dilation of the pupils, colored vision, hallucinations, raving, intoxication, and profound sleep. Roman world, the mushroom was the symbol of death. The word fungus derives from funus ego, bearer of mourning. However, not all mushrooms publicize the fact that they are poisonous in such an obvious way. Some of them even lie camouflaged in the dense woods. Various species either conceal themselves or signal their presence to predators. Even the edible mushrooms hide themselves very well. But in this case, it's impossible not to notice them. At midnight, the Astreus Igrometricus begins to open. The fruit-bearing body containing the spores opens as a result of its extraordinary capacity to pick up the slightest trace of humidity in the air. The backward bending of the star-shaped fruit-bearing body enables it to detach itself from the mycelium. At dawn, like a vampire fleeing the heat of the sun, the star closes to protect its precious contents until the next night. Closing up also makes it possible to roll away from the spot where it was generated. In fields and meadows, we can easily tread on mushrooms like this. The puffballs, having reached maturity, literally explode. In this instant, this one is launching around 200 billion spores. Other spores have become specialized to the point where they can resist the gastric juices of animals and be normally eliminated and so dispersed. You shouldn't be surprised to meet these Coprinus comati growing on dung. The different shapes of the fruit-bearing bodies imply different methods of producing the spores. The Clathrus cancellatus, with its reticular structure, has devised an infallible method for attracting insects. The sticky substance it emits from its fruit-bearing body gives off an odor of rotten meat that attracts the flies. When the insects land on it, they become covered with the spores. 
When they fly away, they take the spores with them. At the base of the broadleaf trunk grows the tiny Cyathus striatus. As soon as it matures, the thin membrane covering it breaks, revealing several minute sacs, the peridioli containing the spores. Every once in a while, a drop of water falls into the little cup and the peridioli are forced out and thrown far away. They can survive for months in this condition. One day, they will open up and scatter their contents. Along will come a cow and eat the grass and with it the spores. This way, a future full of mushrooms is assured. Fungi are plants that have adapted themselves to live their entire lives underground. However, this choice poses problems that are not easily solved. First of all, they can't achieve a chlorophyll synthesis. In order to resolve the problem, they have established a symbiotic relationship with the roots of other plants, to which they relinquish a series of mineral substances such as phosphorus and potassium, and receive in exchange the sugars necessary for their metabolism. In addition, the inability to reproduce underground has forced the fungi to bring their fruit-bearing body to the surface in order to scatter their spores as far as possible. Dispersing seeds in order to assure future generations is a problem for the entire vegetable kingdom, and each species was forced to devise its own individual strategy. <laughs> 